In the Old Testament, God instructed Moses and the children of Israel not to make any image of any creature below the waters, on the earth, or above in the skies, because there is this danger, given their context in Egypt, that to depict the things of this, the creatures of this world, that that image could be worshipped, because the Egyptians worshipped all kinds of creatures as God. But this changes with the advent of Christ, when God becomes incarnate and takes the form of a man. All of a sudden now, God can be visualized. He takes on flesh and blood. And so for the early Christians, all of a sudden is born for the people of God, art in which God can be depicted and the holy could be depicted. And so it's fascinating, as St. Paul will say in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus is the icon. In fact, that's the word used in the Greek there. Jesus is the icon of the invisible God. Now, because of Jesus, we can depict God in art. So we're going to talk tonight about the beautiful Christian and ancient Christian tradition of iconography. What is special about this sacred form of art? That's what we're going to find out tonight. If you've ever seen a beautiful icon, you know what a powerful tool it can be for prayer, for meditation, for reflection. Sometimes people call icons windows into heaven or into the heavenlies. And that's really true. And I, I love icons. We have a lot of icons here at the Augustine Institute, and we've commissioned some beautiful artwork and icons at the Augustine Institute that adorns our classrooms and some of our uh, major spaces here and our chapel at the Augustine Institute. And there's a wonderful artist that we discovered. Uh, she was the wife of one of our uh, students early on at the Augustine Institute, and now one of our alumni, Joseph Zelasko. And she did a, a couple beautiful icons for us that were really striking. And so we had her work on others. And so it's a real joy for me to talk about art with this wonderful artist, Elizabeth Zelasko. So Elizabeth, it's a delight to have you on. I know you've studied art in New York, you've studied art in Colorado, uh, at the Prosopon School of Iconography, and uh, we just really treasure your work. So I'm so glad to have you as a, as a guest here. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And I, I wanna just mention out before I forget, you have a website, so people who are interested as we have this conversation, if they wanna look up uh, your website. What is your, your yeah, website? Yeah, it's elizabethzelasko.com. That's pretty simple. Yeah, elizabethzelasko.com. The easiest Polish name is what my husband says. Yeah. <laughs> it is an easy yeah, Polish yeah. name. <laughs> we have some very difficult Polish names oh, here gosh, yeah. with people yeah. like Dr. Gieszczek. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. You know, that's that, a tough one. Well, what, what, what stirred your heart? You know, and I think of Exodus 36. Moses talks with the artists who are going to help with the Ark of the Covenant and all the things yeah. around the liturgy. And, and it mentions that these artists that God stirred their heart to do this work. So what stirred your heart to do this work of iconography? Uh, so I, I can remember it uh, exactly this one moment in time, and, and life doesn't always work that way, but this, I had a moment for sure, mm -hmm. I had an encounter. Um, I was going to art school, a fine art school, I wasn't studying iconography yet, um, and I was going to the School of Visual Arts in New York, and I was just kind of I felt kind of lost. I just thought, I, there's something more. There's got to be something more to all of this. I just didn't, I, I, and a fire wasn't lit in me yet. I loved artwork, but I, I just felt like there was something else. Um, and I visited my brother. He was in Wisconsin at the time. Um, and I was in a church by myself, and there was this icon there. Mm. And it was, it was so romantic. I mean, it, it was a dark church. There were candles lit, and I was just praying in front of this icon. Um, and that was my moment. That was just a turning point for me. I just thought, this thing is so beautiful and it's so otherworldly. You know, it just was ancient in a way that um, just really spoke to me. And I just thought, I have to, when I go home, I have to find out if there's a place to learn how to do this. Wow. And thank goodness for Google. And uh, <laughs> there was. I mean, I, I just looked it up and it was the Prosopon School. And I, and I called them and I, I left the School of Visual Arts to study iconography after that. And of course, the, I know the, some of the people at that school, the Prozapon, came from Russia, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, and the Russians 
have a great, they've really kept the tradition going all the way back to the Byzantium period yeah. of iconography. And when you're talking about the Byzantium period is fifth to eighth century. This is early, early Christian mm -hmm. tradition and culture. And of course it was the Russians uh, who especially treasured iconography. And they have kept the tradition so well. I mean, it's really, really alive. It was just, it was an experience to be there. I was really grateful. So yeah. you're moved by this icon in this yeah. church. And so, and you're, you're finding a purpose to this calling that you felt to do art, this attraction to art. Mm -hmm. But now that calling became not just a natural calling within you, but it did it, you experienced it as a divine calling, as a spiritual calling? I feel like it was. I mean, I, how could it not be, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a very specific, it's a very specific thing to study. I mean, you can, you can do all kinds of things with an art degree. Um, and I just kind of put it all behind me and mm. just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to just do this one thing. It, it, it really was, um, an answered prayer though. It was everything that I loved. I loved art history. I loved very detailed, you know, delicate work and, um, and I loved my faith so that it was just, it, it was all, it ticked all the boxes for me. I yeah. want to talk, I'm going to ask you in a moment about the method of, cause I think a lot of people don't realize that there's a rich tradition, not only of having icons, but how icons are written. And in fact, that even that terminology might be foreign to some people that you write an icon. People yeah. would think, well, don't you paint an icon? But we talk about writing icons and all the tradition around that. But first I wanna invite our audience to ask uh, any questions you have to join our conversation. Uh, we have a text line, so you can join us at seven, just text your question, put your name and a question for Elizabeth uh, at 720-650-0100. So that's 720-650-0100. So text us your questions about art, about iconography, and art and faith. Please join the conversation. We would, we would appreciate that. So Elizabeth, let me ask you, there, a lot of people don't know this about iconography, if it's done in a traditional way, that it's not just about throwing paint on a canvas. And we have one of your beautiful icons right behind us here, uh, your, this beautiful painting you did of the Annunciation for us. But it's not just about throwing paint on a canvas or having artistic techniques. There's something spiritual and traditional about how, it, how an icon is um, prepared and, and written. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's so many different kinds of traditions out there when it comes to sacred art. Um, I learned specifically for iconography, it was Orthodox, Russian Orthodox iconography. So that's going to be very different than some of our Roman sacred art. Mm -hmm. um, but all of it is different than secular art, as you would yeah as you could imagine. Um, but the prayer that goes into it has to be different than as such. So, um, so for instance, uh, this painting that I did of the Annunciation, although it's not a, a Russian Orthodox icon, I approached it in the same amount of prayer as I would mm. a, a, an Orthodox icon. So there's certain prayers that are said before um, you, you start to paint or write. Um, and I, I have those prayers with yeah, me. Yeah, would you share one of those yeah, prayers? I, I would yeah. love for people to experience that because I, I don't I think people realize yeah. all that goes into the production or yeah. writing of an uh, icon or a Christian art. And there's even fasting. There's certain, um, yeah. you should abstain from meat when you're, they say that a lot of um, Orthodox iconographers are vegans. Wow. Because you can't just fast all the time. So, you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll share this with wow. you. This is really beautiful. Um, so this is before you write an icon, or, or I use it for painting also. Glory to thee, O God, glory to thee. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, and immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. And then you say the glory be in the Our Father, and this is specifically the, the prayer for iconography. O divine Lord of all that exists, you have illuminated the apostle and evangelist Luke with your most holy spirit, thereby enabling him to represent the most holy mother, the one who held you in her arms and said, the grace of him who has been born of me is spread throughout the world. Enlighten and direct our souls, our hearts, and our spirits. Mm -hmm. Guide the hands of your unworthy servants so that we may worthily and perfectly portray your icon, that of your holy mother and of all the saints, for the glory, joy, and adornment of your holy church. Forgive our sins and the sins of those who will venerate these icons and who, standing devoutly before them, give homage to those they represent. 
protect them from all evil, and instruct them with good counsel. This we ask through the prayers of the Most Holy Theotokos, the Apostle Luke, and all the saints, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. Oh, it's so beautiful because I, I love the image of St. Luke. And a lot of people may not know that there's this great tradition that Luke, the evangelist Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, wrote the first icon, right, mm -hmm. that, uh, of the Blessed Mother yeah, of Our so Lady. Tradition says, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Would you take one of your traditional icons? Oh, yeah. I think you have yeah, one. Absolutely. And show that to everyone. Yes, yeah, so this is the, um, this is a Russian Orthodox. This is uh, the guardian angel. Mm. Um, so this you, is you, the... You wrote that. You painted yes, it. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. And why do we talk about icons? People are going to ask, why, why do we talk about writing an icon rather than painting an icon? I think it's just, that? it's a way of really um, making the, the, the difference between, this is not just a painting. Mm. Um, it's not, it's not even art necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's not in that realm. So, um, I think it's also um, an issue of the translation of Russian to English. I heard that also mm -hmm. that they don't can, a painter paints a fence, but a, an artist is an author uh, of, of a work of art. So there's a little bit of um, of that in there too. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell us about your this piece. I love it. Yeah. So this is done on one piece of wood, and it's carved out by the the boards themselves. Actually, take a really long time to make. I usually pay other people to do that because mm -hmm. it's so <laughs> it's so time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, they carve out this little indentation you yeah. can see by hand. It's like a window. That's where some people yeah. get the idea of window, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it kind of symbolizes the the outside of the icon and the inside, and that's kind of like mm -hmm. us as humans. We have you know, an outside that we present, and then we also have this mm. interior life. Um, in this part of the halo, there's always like elements that pop out onto the outside, and that's kind of the, we think of that as evangelization. So that's mm. the little piece that we, we bring out into the world. Uh, Isn't that neat? Yeah. yeah, so the top part of the halo there is going above the border. Exactly. Outside. Yeah. yeah, and there's always some elements here, like the incense is oh, just yeah. popping out. Oh, yeah. But it's done with uh, very particular materials as opposed to a, a religious, you know, or a sacred art, um, a painting. You can do those in oil or acrylic. You can you can use whatever you want. But for the Orthodox, they use very particular. Um, they're very strict about what goes into the icon. It's egg tempera painting, which is basically how we used to paint before there were art stores. But it's ground up pigment and egg and wine um, and you make your own paint. So all of the colors you see here, I made. You made those made, colors. Made well, the that's colors. quite the process. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Is. Yeah, it takes a long time wow. to make one of these, but it, um, but the whole the whole process is very prayerful. Every portion of this is symbolic of of something. So uh, yeah, that, and that's. I mean, it took a long time to learn all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever I paint, I go through. Whenever I write, rather. I go through just all of those, mm -hmm. the whole, all the steps. I think that's one of the things that's intriguing to people. They have that, like, when you were in that church, um, you have that experience of the icon and the beauty, and it's a window. But as you studied it, you realize that there's great symbolism, and there's quite a, a tradition of these symbols. What's one of the symbols uh, there that you would highlight to people? That so I, I really, the thing that really struck me when I was learning about them was the halo. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, so this is actually um, clay, this this color. It's oh, not wow. paint, it's actually liquid clay. Wow. Um, and this is what's underneath the halo. And so mm -hmm. you paint the clay on, and in order to get the gold leaf to adhere, you breathe onto the clay. Wow, just and that the, just reminds me of Genesis. Oh, this yeah, God breathes into Adam out of the from Bible. the clay. Yeah, yeah from the yeah. soil. And that's what, know, what the has Adam. the, it's the vessel. The clay is the vessel mm -hmm. to hold God, and God is the gold. And um, so the red line goes on because the, the clay has been purified. So it's like this pure red mm -hmm. color. And that's the first the first paint that goes on. So everything else at this point is just gesso, board, wow. gold, and clay. And then after that red line is painted, everything is paint. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But that was that was just, I mean, how poetic is that? You know, yeah. and it's very easy just to gloss over little elements like that. I love it. Yeah. You know, um, one of the uh, other icons you did, which I, well, this is one of the first ones I think you did for yeah. us. Yeah. So was it the first? I, I might because John I feel Paul like II. Saint Clair was, but, yeah. I, but this is old, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, John Paul II, of course, is one of our patrons here, and the inspiration for the new evangelization, and and so you did this beautiful icon of, of Saint John Paul II, mm -hmm. and th that reminds me of you know because people ask these these icons are so beautiful, so many that you've done for us. 
we've put them, uh, we've made prints for people to be able to get these. And so it's on Catholic Dump Market. So people can, you know, anybody at home can get this at Catholic Dump Market and uh, at our store online. And, uh, and you can see other work that Elizabeth has done there, and we want to make it accessible to others. But we really love this icon of, of John Paul II. And this is a good example, too. You can kind of see the difference between yeah, something wanted... that's orthodox and something that is more Roman. Um, it's a little bit more lifelike, uh, less and less stylized, um, and that just shows you the different different traditions that different we have. Different traditions, yeah. yeah. So I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Diversity of, of Love traditions Love John there. Paul, too. Well, Maddie asks, how long does it take you to write an icon? Um, yeah, the first one, really long, really. Because <laughs> you're, I mean, it's a slow process of learning, mm -hmm. so it depends on how many hours you can mm -hmm. get into the studio to learn. But um, now I think I'm, I'm about, I can do, depending on the size and the complexity, anywhere between like 20 and 40 hours. Uh -huh. I believe this one took 40 hours, the guardian angel one. So it's a, it's a good long while. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of detail in that icon. It's, yeah. It's just, it's, it's and there's really... so many layers, too. I mean, you have to, uh -huh. you, it's kind of this stacking process of dark, dark mm. paint and then a highlight and then more dark paint, and, and you just kind of build it all the way up. Wow. Yeah. Well, then we have something like this. This is one you recently did for the Augusta yeah. Institute. We have it in our atrium. And uh, just love this. This is the Annunciation. And so we have the Angel Gabriel, a, appearing to Our Lady. And, you know, this is kind of the, what we would call here the Nova Vetter, the new and the old. So there's, you know, like you said, you're using the old style of how you approach an uh, iconography. Mm -hmm. And yet there's, there's a more Romanesque in terms of the dynamism of what's going on. For sure. Why don't yeah. you tell us some of, the, some of the major pieces of this icon structurally, and then we can work into some of the symbolism, because yeah, I absolutely. think it's a great piece. I love this work. Yeah, this was more than 40 hours for sure. <laughs> yeah, this is a few months, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a good number of months. What I wanted to focus on with this Annunciation piece uh, was light. Mm. I just, I really wanted that to come across. Um, you know, God said, let there be light. And, and Mary said, let it be done unto me. And that really brought mm. the light of Christ into the world. So uh, you, sometimes you'll see that the angels, the, the person that's glowing or the, you know, the subject matter that's glowing. Um, but this, I really wanted it to be God coming down and Mary's the thing that's glowing actually, mm. and the angel is actually lit up entirely from light that is bouncing off of Mary. Wow, Man. that's so that's so special. Yeah, but there's a lot of elements picture. in here that are from iconography. Um, the back wall that's very typical um, Orthodox icon style. It's very flat. Um, the, the stool that she's sitting on and the foot piece. That's that's a lot of classical iconography in that. Um, but a lot of uh, most of it, I would say, is is more Roman for sure. And I, there's a the the wall behind Mary. Do you want to explain some of that? There's an inset there with Ave and Eve. Yes, on the yes. Because so the is, Ave reminds us of the angel, mm -hmm. the angel's greeting to to Mary. Right. And yeah. and she is the new the new Eve. Yeah. You know. Um, so we have that, um, and that sort of this is again is another traditional thing in iconography to have the recessed. It means something else is going on in this picture. So I, a lot of uh, the viewers have probably seen um, the really traditional, like Rublev, um, the Trinity icon. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the table that they're sitting on has one of those recessed areas, and it just means there's something more to this picture here than mm -hmm. what you're just, you know, seeing. Um, so that's where we we place the Ave and then Eve back there, and and obviously the the tree is also a nod to that as well. That you have the serpent and the apples. Um, I love the snake in this in this painting because he's really like he's reaching forward trying to get at her, mm. but he can't. He's just he has no power in this in this story. Yeah, I love, yeah. He's 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 in the background of the darkness, but mm -hmm. our lady's adorned with the light that's mm -hmm. coming from God. Yep. And, uh, and he can't. He's he's not able to to tempt her in this moment. And there's just little details like this little ball of yarn that's down at Our Lady's feet. Where does that come from? Yeah, apparently there's a tradition that, that she was the one that uh, was the, she wove the um, the veil, the shroud, or the shroud yep, of the, yep, the of veil the in the temple. The veil in the mm -hmm. temple. Um, so it, you'll see her in, in the Annunciation icons. The, if you just look up like, you know, traditional Orthodox iconography of the Annunciation, you'll see that she's ho either holding it or it's somewhere in the scene, in the this scene. bit of yarn. So I love that. This is a nod to the tradition mm -hmm. of uh, the different art artists who have done the scene of the Annunciation. Yeah. 
And then Our Lady's holding uh, a book mm -hmm. for her prayer time, one would think, as the angel approaches her. Yeah. yeah, it's probably hard to see on camera. It says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Mm. I love that prophecy. You, you get that in uh, Zephaniah and then Zechariah have this oracle to Our Lady, uh, but it's to daughter Zion, and, and to daughter Zion being Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And of course, the prophecy for me in the background it gets me excited is that the temple has been vacated. It's been abandoned. God's left. Mm -hmm. and, but there's this promise that God's going to come in and dwell with daughter Zion. And now you realize Mary is the daughter Zion. And God's going to dwell literally in her womb. And yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's an astounding fulfillment Oof, of yeah. that uh, the great divine promise. That gives you chills. There, yeah. There's a really neat icon. Um, and it, it's, it's something like she who is wider than the heavens because mm. that which is, cannot be contained was contained within her, mm. within her womb. So like all the cosmos was inside of her. It yeah. just kind of, I mean, it really blows your mind. It's just, uh, it's so, it's so rich, you know, our yeah. faith is just so, so yeah. rich. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really powerful. Well, a uh, couple of questions that come in. Gigi asks, do you do multiple icons at one time or can, for your work, do you just do one at a time or can you do multiple uh, pieces at one time? That's a great question. I try to just do one at a time. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's a matter of, um, it's like having a nice conversation with somebody. You don't mm -hmm. want to be on your phone texting at the mm -hmm. same time. Yep. Yeah. Somebody was saying, somebody asked me an interesting question the other day. They said, um, you know, who, who, which which piece do you find most? Like, what do you what do you meditate on while you're painting? And it reminded me of some, somebody asked John Paul II a question. He's, "What's your favorite food to eat?" And he's like, "Whatever's right in front of me." <laughs> and I just thought yeah. that's kind of how it, how it works. Whatever whatever saints in front of me, mm -hmm. whatever commission is in front of me, I'm all in. I, I mm -hmm. will try to listen to you know audio books about the saint or YouTube videos about the saint or I'll read whatever I can. But I really just try to be present to that particular saint and see what they have to say, you know. That's, uh, that's why is it yeah. deep, deep work mm -hmm. uh, takes focus. Yeah. Great focus, right? Yeah. And uh, Lisa asked, do you, do you take inspiration from the Gospels or is it, uh, does it come to you from other places or from prayer? I think all over. I mean, mm -hmm. God, God works in that kind of, I mean, mm -hmm. gosh, even a good sunset will be mm -hmm. inspiring, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's everywhere. Yeah, every, everything is, is inspiring. I think if you pay attention, I think mm -hmm. all things can be uh, quite helpful. As you were praying and working on this piece, what, what was some of the inspirations that, from the scripture passage and the story of Our Lady that you just keep going back to that just really made a deep impression on you? Mm. I think her, um, it was her willingness. Uh, I think there's even, I mean, she said, let it be done, but there's also like, I will it to be done. I wish mm. it to be done. And um, the way that she's leaning in, I think just speaks of that. Mm. I mean, she's, she's bracing herself because this is, this is her people yeah. have been waiting for this moment, yeah. you know, and she's, I you love know, how you, you have her leaning forward. Yeah. yeah, is that that's part of the idea? She's leaning forward because she she's she leaning into this. God's will. Yeah, yeah. She, let it be done. Like let's let's yeah. I, uh, I say yes. Oh, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, a, a viewer asks, and I love this question. Why don't more churches invest in original icons and and art and paintings rather than prints? I was just in a church in Virginia last yeah. weekend, and uh, I won't say which church, but they had a print of their patron. But it was a printed icon. I'm like, oh, please, what? What are they doing with a, a print? They should have an original piece. And then I found out talking to somebody after church that they they're just commissioning somebody. Uh, they, oh, that's good. They got a, a, yeah. a good priest, and he's commissioning somebody to do a real original piece yeah. of artwork. Yeah. But it's so true. Why? Why? Why is that? Yeah, if we could get this person to maybe be uh, head of some of these, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's just it, though. We do. We need. We need people who are in the position to hire people to be aware yeah. of that. Um, the ch I just uh, there was something online today. It was like the church needs art, and yeah, it's it like does. yes, it really does. This is a, beauty is a part of that conversation. Yeah. Um, truth and goodness. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is a. It's a. It's a triptych right there. I mean, you can't just do without I, I, any of them. Um, mm -hmm. But the beauty, it, it truly is important. 
Uh, and there is something about the the original, like being in front of, have you ever been to a museum? If you see a print of a Van Gogh or you're in front of a painting by yeah. Van Gogh, I think that's what it was with this, being in front of this icon. It wasn't a, it wasn't a printed icon. I mean, by right. all means, we have printed icons, that's yep. fine. But in our sacred spaces, I think it yes, needs, that's, to, I think it needs to be an encounter. I think so. Yeah, and humans, I think, encounter, mm. they can encounter God there, there's that element mm -hmm. of humanity where it's like somebody did that with their hands. They honored God with their hands and they created this thing and it gives glory to God. And I think that there's a real open window in that. And I think of, I think about your process of, you know, taking all the ingredients and making the paints, but praying right. and those prayers you do, it's, it's really a sacred process. And so True. for our sacred spaces, yeah, if, if, if I could, you know, uh, have my say, I would ban any print art in, in churches. I would, <laughs> yeah, I I would only a, yeah. allow original work. Yeah. And that's something, you know, I, I know we try to do at the Augusta Institute. You know, we, you we want very well. we, yeah. we want to have original pieces mm -hmm. for our students who are coming to study theology yeah. and to contemplate the yeah. truths of our faith. And you can feel that walking around, I think. But yeah. also, I mean, you heard the prayer. The When I painted this, I was praying for the mm. students here. Oh. You know, every time, every mm. time, it's like they're going to be in front of this. They're going to see this work, and mm -hmm. um, it's just such a blessing to be able to pray for for people through work that I do. Oh, you know? I think that's such yeah. a beautiful thing, and I think that does it makes it as you saw early on the difference between secular painting, which just simply looks at beauty and and what the message is, versus sacred, mm -hmm. which just sees the meaning behind the art yeah. and the meaning to those who are going to view it which is, I think, really beautiful. Um, well, Jerry asks, you know, why are the faces of icons stylized? And of course, that's true for your, um, you know, Byzantine and, and, you know, the more classical icon. Then you can get Neo-Byzantine, which has a little bit more fluidity, and then you can have a cross between that. So why don't you talk about wh why, yeah. why, is, why are the more classical icons so stylized? Mm -hmm. um, I think because, I mean, think of when they started, um, there was no photography. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of that too, I'm sure. Uh, but the, it's not concerned with, with painting something that's realistic. They were able to paint realistically because mm -hmm. you, you, there's some really interesting icons where um, the artist would, or the iconographer would paint themselves in there and very lifelike, you know, like very small in mm -hmm. yep. the corner. So they yep. were capable. It wasn't that they weren't, weren't capable, but um, it's more of the symbol because it isn't just a piece of art. You're not mm -hmm. going to approach this thing and say, oh, they did a really good job. They're going to wash that all away, and we're just going to be in front of this thing, which is timeless. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, they're going to have hairstyles mm -hmm. that, you know, are modern, or um, it really is just this very timeless piece. Um, there's also symbolism to the, the structure so that the it's more important to see God than it is to just, you know, talk too much. So the mouth is very small mm -hmm. and the eyes are usually very large. Wow. Yeah. So th there's re you know, usually a large forehead is a sign of wisdom. Mm. So they're showing that you'll see sometimes icons of younger Jesus and you're like, whoa, he's scary looking almost, you know, <laughs> but there's he's a reason a behind it. Yeah, he's got a lot of <laughs> wisdom in of there. Wisdom. Yeah. He's yes, containing indeed. the cosmos wow. in there. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> I wonder too, and, and those are Fabulous, and, I, I, and it's certainly true for the Byzantium style. I wonder too, studying um, ancient Rome, there was only one image of, of a Caesar because they wanted it, you know, they didn't have, you know, video and television, but there would be one approved um, portrait or image of Caesar, and then any other portrait of Caesar had to copy that. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting in the early Christian art is that Jesus is depicted almost the same way. Peter is depicted almost the same, which is beautiful when you go to the catacombs, you can say, oh, that's Peter. that's Peter. Or if you go to any of these ancient churches, you know who Jesus is and you know who Peter is and you know Paul looks even you know, different from that. And yeah. so there's, there's a sense in which the early Christians followed that Roman tradition. It's really good storytelling. Well, this, is, yeah. this time goes by so fast, but Elizabeth, this has been such a joy. Yeah. Thank you oh, for joining thank us you. and sharing your craft with us. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and we're, all, we're so blessed here at the Augusta Institute that you share your, your, your great talents with us in doing all these great works. Which, uh, and I just want to say to anybody, if you ever visit the Augusta Institute, you can see uh, mm -hmm. some of these beautiful pieces live. We have a great icon that I love that you did of, of St. Augustine, our patron. Mm -hmm. Uh, that down was a chapel. great, yeah, down mm -hmm. in our chapel. So you have to come and visit the Augustine Institute Chapel. We, we have mass at noon uh, every weekday. You're welcome to join us there. But uh, 
So it's, it's such a joy. Uh, you know, there's so many fruits, I think, of the new evangelization is this recovery of art and iconography, which is starting to happen more and more. And we're going to talk about the new evangelization and St. John Paul II next week. And so my guest next week will be uh, Dr. Sean Innerst, who's uh, here, a professor here at the Augustine Institute and our dean. And I hope you can join us to discuss uh, our, our conversation for the new evangelization. And I want to thank everybody who supports us here at the Augustine Institute through the Mission Circle and through all your support at the Augustine Institute. We want to be a light and, uh, and let the, the truth about God, the icon, the image of God be known in the world more and more. So thank you so much for your support and may the Lord bless and keep you all.